John chapter 4, 43 to 54. Now after the two days he departed from there and went to Galilee. But Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honour in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The noble man said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and, and he went his way, and he was now going down. His servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we, we do pray that as we uh, consider the words of this passage that you'll bless these words to us and, and help us to understand the teaching from, from these words. And Lord, we, we pray that uh, you will help us to believe without necessarily seeing a sign or a wonder. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If I see it, then I'll believe it. Now, my son is a, uh, has been a budding performer. He, he's quite musical, but he loved to do magic tricks. And, of course, he has my granddaughters mem mesmerised with his tricks. Even when you see it, you can't believe it. Friends, how often... Has your spouse said this phrase, if I see it, then I'll believe it, <laughs> especially for the men. Often, of course, as part of a conversation when you've been asked to do something, most likely for us men it's a job or a chore of some sort that you'll do sometime, often when you feel like it. Yes, I'll do it. And often you'll hear a condescending response, I'll believe it when I see it. Of course, the response is sarcastic, grown from scepticism. There is disbelief that you're going to do something. Jesus performed many miracles that the, that the multitude saw. They saw them, but they didn't necessarily believe. In fact, we read in verse 45, when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him. They'd seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the Passover feast because they were there as well. They saw Jesus do miracles. He did them in Judea at the beginning of his ministry. He did them in Judea at the end of his ministry. And in the middle of Jesus' three-year period of ministry, he was in Galilee, and that's where we find him in verse 46. The Galileans, like the people of Jerusalem, believed Jesus to be a miracle worker. Jesus, as a miracle worker, was universally believed. Even the Jewish leaders acknowledged that Jesus performed miracles, but they rejected him as Saviour and Messiah. No one questioned that Jesus did miracles. It's impossible to question that. The miracles were too frequent, they were too complete to deny them. Even Nicodemus confesses in John chapter 3, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs 
that you do unless God is with him. So we find the same kind of attitude, the same level of belief that you find in Galilee. They believed in him as a miracle worker. And sometimes this is a rather common way to believe and a common way to think of Jesus, that he is a miracle, belief, a miracle worker. Yes, there's plenty of evidence for that. In Jesus' ministry, disease was essentially banished from Palestine. The records are clear in the gospel, Gospels and there's never been an effective assault on the miracles of Jesus that's been able to discredit them in any way. Too many eyewitnesses, too many times, too many places. So when we come to John's record of Jesus' second miracle, this one, this second sign, specifically suits John's purpose. The miracle is about believing. And Je Jesus highlights to us in verse 48, then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. And the word believed comes up again in verse 50. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went his way. And continues in verse 53 as well. And he himself believed and his whole household. It's a story of a miracle, but it's more than that. It's about believing. And this fits the whole purpose of John's gospel when we, when we come to chapter 20, verse 31, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. In other words, that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So John's gospel is the gospel of believing. The word believe is used a hundred times in John's gospel, mostly about believing in Jesus for salvation. First century Judaism, as it is today, is a system of religion similar to other systems of religion in the world that believes that you gain heaven by something that you do. These religions believe that faith is a part of it, but not all of it, because a work system is involved with ceremonies and rituals and routines and forms of morality and obedience and kindness and good deeds. And the accumulated effect of the goodness of a person is what gains heaven. <coughs> in effect, there are only two kinds of religion that exist. One is the religion of human achievement and the other is the religion of faith. And that's the true gospel. Everything else is some mixture of believing and doing and this kind of religion will fill up hell. This kind of religion will fill up hell. The only religion that populates heaven is connected to faith and by faith alone. For grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This is Paul's summation that we read in Ephesians, 8, Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9. John is presenting to us the good news concerning how people are saved by faith, by belief. And we've already learned this in John chapter 1, Verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. How did he become a child of God? By receiving Christ. Believing is receiving. Believing all that he is. Believing everything that is true about him. That's the idea of the use of his name in scripture. When God says my name is I am that I am, he means my name is who I am. And when you say you believe in the name of Jesus Christ, it means that you believe in everything that he is and that he does. You believe fully in all the gospel. So to become a child of God is simply a matter of believing in his name. Of course, we come to, uh, to John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. To believe here is not connected to works. It's not connected to rituals, or it's not con and it's not connected to ceremonies or accomplishments or morality or goodness. It's believing. And John tells us at the end of chapter 3, verse 36, he believes in the Son, has everlasting life. 
And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. If you believe in the Son, you have life. If you fail to believe, which is actually disobedience, because we're commanded to believe, then you perish. We find this emphasis all through the Gospel of John. And when we come to John 10, 25, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So what else can I do? I've done all these works. I've eliminated disease. I've cast out demons. I've commanded the weather. I've raised the dead. You will not believe. That's the problem. But Jesus says, my sheep hear me and they believe. If you refuse to believe, then you'll die in your sins and perish. This is repeatedly the message of John's gospel. Disbelief, disbelieve and die and perish forever in hell. Or believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and spend forever in the glory of heaven. Eternal salvation comes to those and it comes only to those who believe in the full true person and the work of Christ. So what kind of faith is Jesus talking about? What kind of belief are we talking about here? Well, we get a glimpse of this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith involves something that we don't have. And faith involves something that we can't have and we can't see. We can have it, but we can't see it. Faith involves something not yet attained, something not seen. That's faith. But we need to take this a little further. Otherwise, we could be misled. There are lots of things in life where we exercise faith, things that we can't see, things that we hope for, things that we aren't sure about. Every day we believe things. We get up in the morning and, we, and some of us who still go to work go to work or we do something else, we sit in our cars, we turn on the ignition switch and we believe that the engine will start. Just about every time it does. Human faith is based on two components. One component is based on experience. In other words, because of our experience, we know what will happen. If you go to a restaurant, you look at the menu and you order your choice and you eat what they give you. But you have no clue who's in the kitchen and what they're doing. And you assume that what you've ordered will be brought out and it'll be safe. Because people do it all the time and it generally is. But we know that it isn't always safe. People can get food uh, poisoning at restaurants, even the best of them. Sometimes practices aren't what they should be. But experiences tells us mostly that you can trust it, but sometimes it's wrong and drastically wrong. In Christian faith, we're not talking about that kind of human faith, that kind of faith that's based upon a repeated experience. We're talking about something for which we have no experience. As Christians, we're putting our eternity, our eternal destiny, into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ and we have no previous experience of its certainty. So why would you do that? Why would you say no to your sin, no to your own ambition, no to your own will, no to everything that you cherish and want to do and embrace Christ fully? Simply because that's the only way to get to heaven. But you haven't seen heaven. You don't know anything about heaven other than what we read about in scripture. Contrary to what you read or see in movies, people don't go to heaven and come back. So in receiving Christ and believing on his name, you're taking the most serious step that you'll ever take in your life. But you have no experience. So you better be sure if it's the right move. You need to know that it's not a wrong move. And that's what Hebrews 11.1 1 is saying faith is the confidence, faith is the assurance. Now, what do I mean by confidence? Where, when you build a house these days, you dig deep foundations and fill them with reinforced concrete. 
The depth of the foundations would depend on the quality of the soil. And then you lay a concrete slab maybe or you, or you do pillars and you have a wooden floor on which you build your house. Your concrete foundation is solid. It's something that you can touch and you can know. It's not subjective, it's objective. As Christians, as people of faith, we believe in something that's absolutely firmly established and is concrete. And it's established on the word of God. We believe in the promises of God. We believe in the commands of God. We believe in the truth of God to us given in his word. So when we talk about confidence of something hoped for, it's not confidence in a subjective way. It's not some personal feeling or intuition. Faith is the foundation, the concrete certainty about truth which comes down to the truth of the word of God which focuses on the re reliability of the gospel. So we're talking about a certainty. And although we haven't been to heaven and we, and we haven't come back, the one who dwells in heaven has sent us full and complete and accurate information about it. Everything we need to know is revealed in scripture. It's firm, it's certain, it's concrete confidence in which we believe which leads us to a second word, the word assurance. Assurance goes right alongside this word confidence. It's something that we hold to with absolute commitment. So when we talk about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, this isn't any pie in the sky. This isn't some kind of esoteric feeling or about a, a, a Jesus of our own imagination. We bank our everlasting life on the truth of God's word, which comes for us, dominating assurance. God's word drives our living and informs our hope. That's the kind of faith we're talking about, a real faith in truth as revealed in scripture that focuses on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're all called to believe the gospel truth based on that confidence and assurance. Not to do so is the ultimate human tragedy with eternal repercussions. John takes up, up the issue of believing as the issue of all issues. That's why the gospel record, records are full of miracles, but Jesus knew the hearts of his fellow Jews in Judah and Galilee and says in verse 48, unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him you will never believe. You see, they were so stubborn, and we can be so stubborn too. Even though Jesus was clearly the Messiah, for he fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies, I am the Messiah, yet you demand more and more signs and wonders. That is the deepest kind of unbelief. And by the way, when unbelief rejects the light, the darkness deepens. That's the light of the knowledge of God that every person has. But when you reject the light, the darkness deepens. The darkness gets darker. So in John 4, we have a, an illustration of what was very unusual. Someone actually being saved. Out of all the multitudes of people who saw and heard Jesus speak, out of all that he healed, there were only about, in the end, 500 followers. 120 were meeting in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. They had uh, the signs, they'd seen the signs, yet most didn't believe. But in John 4, there's an illustration of belief of how one man believed who had saving faith. And he happened to be a royal official whose son was sick in Capernaum, which is on the edge of the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. There was only one king in this part of the world and he was the king of Galilee and Perea. His name was Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great and Idumean, a non-Jewish ruler of that part of the world. The Jews didn't like him. He was a vassal king that served the purposes of Rome and was a small petty tyrant. He was a very evil man. John the Baptist condemned him for marrying his brother's wife and getting involved in incest. And in a drunken or orgy, orgy, he consented to John the Baptist's execution and his head was delivered on a platter. 
He's a bad man, this Herod, just like his father, but he's afraid of Jesus and he was afraid of John the Baptist. And in the entire ministry of Jesus, there was one town in Galilee that Jesus never went to, Tiberias, the home of Herod. Herod wanted him dead. Herod was afraid of him. But here's a royal official connected to Herod, Antipas. Antipas. And his son is sick at Capernaum by the Sea of Galilee. And this official believes that Jesus is a miracle worker. He believes what the rest of the people in Galilee believe. And what do they believe? Many people had a superficial faith. What did they believe? They believed he could do miracles. Full stop. End of story. So that was a popular idea. They believed Jesus was a miracle worker. Yes, this was a starting place, but that better not be the ending place. Here's a man who caught the frenzy of Jesus' ministry. And Capernaum was the headquarters of Jesus' miracle ministry in Galilee. So this royal official comes to see Jesus I wonder what moves a man from having a sort of, de of a detached view of Jesus as a miracle worker to move into the reality of who he really is. It's desperation. And that's still true today. Jesus says in Matthew 9, the people who aren't sick aren't looking for a doctor. It's desperation that drives people and it drove this man, this royal official who worked for Herod, to come to Jesus to beg him to save his son to give him life. Sir, come down before my child dies, he says. So he believed that he could heal people. He didn't necessarily believe that he could raise dead people. He has a belief in Jesus as a miracle worker. He has some sort of partial faith. He believed Jesus was a miracle worker. But that's not enough. But that's a place to start. You may ask, why did Jesus accommodate that kind of superficial faith, because all faith has to start somewhere. Why do you think he did the miracles? So people who thought of Jesus as being a miracle worker might ultimately make the necessary connection that Jesus was indeed divine. And then re Jesus responded to the man's plea, go, your son will live. At that very moment, the son's body was instantaneously and miraculously, miraculously healed. But something also happened to the father in verse 50. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and departed. At first, this royal official believed Jesus in his works, but now he believes in his words. Jesus was someone who told or spoke the truth. So this man is moving from believing in the power of Jesus to believing in the truth of Jesus and his words and the trustworthiness of what he says. And this is essential. It's, a, it's wonderful to read the Gospels and see that Jesus performed miracles. But we've got to move beyond the works to the words because the works have no saving power. Only his words had the saving power, and the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. And he departed, and as he's going, his servants met him to tell him that his son was living. The son was full of life. He wasn't just over a fever, he was up and about. And in comparing times, he realised that his son recovered at the exact time that Jesus said that his son would live. And further in verse 53 it says, and he himself believed and his whole household. He himself believed. Wait a minute, he already believed. What do you mean he himself believed? And this is a very emphatic statement. This is a forceful, strong statement. His faith has gone to another level. Not only his faith, faith but his whole household. Somewhere in the encounter with this man, Jesus filled in the blanks of who he was, of his person. It simply says he believed. But he already believed. Yes, he believed that he, he worked miracles, but that's not enough. He believed his words were true. Yes, that's not enough either. 
But now he believed in his person, in his name, in the fullness of who he is, the Messiah, the Son of God. The gospel says this, put your faith in Christ, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. You can believe in Jesus as one who performs miracles, that's good. You can believe in Jesus' works to be the works of God. No one can do what he did except God is with him. That's good. You can believe in Jesus' words to be the very words of God. When Jesus speaks, God speaks. But there's more than that. Believe in his full person as the Son of God. And that's the purpose of John. John's Gospel. That these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That day, this Jewish family believed along with their household. Months later, Jesus would carry the full weight of their punishment on the cross when he died for all their sins. At that same time, he died for you and he died for me. Believe in him and have everlasting life. Don't rely on that first statement, I'll believe when I see it. Believe his words because he is indeed the Son of God. Amen. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage. We thank you for the life of this man who stepped out of uh, uh, his comfort zone to see Jesus. As a royal official, he knew that he was treading on some difficult ground. But we thank you for the belief that he had. We thank you, Lord, that you enabled him to believe as well. We thank you that he believed in who Jesus was. And we pray, Lord, that that might be our experience as well and the experience of many, many people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again.